Jesus and all that he's done for me. My soul cries out, hallelujah, thank you. All week, I just thank him because it could have been worse. My family's doing pretty good. But then, you know, you see somebody else that's not. So, and I work in a hospital, you know, and I see sick folks all week. And I got something to thank God for. Yeah, he's been mighty good. Thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. And I praise you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. Cause you've been so good. So good yeah, and you've been so good. So good and I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. And I praise you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. Cause you set my soul. My soul free. Yeah, you set my soul. My soul free. And you've been a doctor. You've been my lawyer. You've been my heart fixer and mine. You made a way. You made the blind to see. Even made. Oh, I thank you, Lord. Let's say that again. And I thank you, Lord. And I praise you, Lord. Cause you've been so good. Yeah, yeah, you've been so good. And I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. And I praise you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. Cause you set my soul. My soul yeah, yeah, you set my soul. My soul and you've been a doctor. You've been my lawyer. Lord, you've been my heart fixer and a mind. You made a way. You made the blind to see. Even made. Lord, I want to thank you. You made a way for me. Lord, I want to thank you. You've been a fence all around me. You laid the foundation, made the way plain, brought me out of sin and shame. Oh, I thank you, Lord. Yeah, I thank you, Lord. And I praise you, Lord. Cause you've been so good Yeah, yeah, you've been so good And I thank you, Lord And I praise you, Lord Cause you set my soul Yeah, yeah, you set my soul Yeah, yeah, you set my soul Yeah, yeah, you set my soul And you've been a doctor You've been my lawyer Lord, you've been my heart, and of mine. You made a way. You made the blind to see. Even made. Oh, I thank you, Lord. I want to sing that verse again. Lord, I want to thank you. You made a way for me. Lord, I want to thank you. You've been a fence all around me. You laid the foundation, made the way plain. You brought me out of sin and shame, Lord. And I thank you, Lord. Yeah, I thank you, Lord. And I praise you, Lord. Cause you've been so good. Yes, yes, you've been so good. Yes, yes, you've been so good. You've been so good, and you've been a doctor, you've been a lawyer, Lord, you my heart, you made a way, you made the blind to see and the light, even man, oh, I thank you, Lord, yeah, thank you, Lord.
Don't have my brother, it's me, oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer. Not my sister, not my brother, it's me, oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer. Not my preacher, not my deacon, it's me, oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer. Not my preacher, not my deacon, it's me. Let us say amen. Amen, amen. I think the young lady's name was what? Janiah. That's a beautiful name. Um, would the uh, mother and grandmother and grandfather and the rest of the family, would they just stand? Let's say amen. I think. Uh, Janiah, she, you're supposed to go over to the children's church. Amen. She, she's looking at this and saying, my goodness, don't tell me there's something else I got to do. Yep, that's, that, that's Janiah, that's what training is all about. Amen. The Lord didn't, didn't uh, bring you into his fold to just sit down, but he brought you in in order to grow and to work. Let us say amen. amen. This is Super Bowl Sunday. Do I get any, uh, any reaction to that? Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> Which for some of us really doesn't mean anything. Yeah. They, uh, they had on TV, some of you possibly saw it, they had a gospel celebration celebrating Super Bowl Sunday. And I thought that that was unique. And maybe they should continue that... Um, uh, that, that process um, from here on in. Just before we begin with our word, and I know you don't like to do this because when you come in, you get comfortable, you sit down and everything. But if, let's say if you came to my house and you were sitting in the living room and you came for dinner and the dining room was about maybe two or three doors down and if I said dinner's ready, I'm sure you wouldn't sit in, in the living room. You'd get up and move to the dining room, wouldn't you? Amen? Let's move to the dining room in the center aisle. Dinner is ready. 
Dinner is ready. Amen. Is that a pretty good analogy? <laughs> Amen. Good to see each of you this morning. Those that are sitting in the rear, uh, unless you got children with you, come on over. I, I, I don't know. We'll, we'll go to a movie and be crowded in. We'll go to games and be crowded in. I don't know why we like to be scattered when it comes to God's house. But yet when we get in trouble, we want the family there with us. Amen. So I'm, I'm not going to tell you the purpose of this because, you know, this is First Sunday Lord's Supper, and in serving it makes it easier for the deacons to do that. Amen. Then it makes it easier for my eyes to see too instead of my head doing like that. Amen. While we are assembling ourselves in the center aisle, if you have your Bible, open it to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 4, um, verse 25, 26, and then come over to verse 39 to 42. Gospel of John. Uh, our thought this morning comes out of a continuation of our message about two Sundays ago, the Samaritan woman that Jesus met at the well, and I want to continue in terms of that thought that the Holy Spirit is leading me. It's so much in terms of spiritual nuggets that are in this uh, context until I think that it is... Uh, that it behooves us to explore it in order that, um, that we might receive spiritual substance. The Gospel of John, the fourth chapter, verses beginning at verse 25 and 26, and then coming over to verse 39. Amen? I'm reading from the New King James Version, which means that it's the King James but the old English uh, nouns and pronouns of thy, those, and, um, and, and that sort of thing have been taken out and just the regular nouns and pronouns that as we speak are used. Amen? Verse 25 said, the woman said to him, talking, she's uh, talking to Jesus after they have just about concluded their conversation. <clears throat> I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And then Jesus responds in verse 26. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. And then come down to verse 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Then they said to the woman, now we believe not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. You may be seated. I want to look at the aspect of faith here and the desperation, even though some may not be aware of it or some may not, may not admit it, the desperation of a sinner and especially in this day and time that, are, um, and naturally, I'm, I'm looking at it from the perspective of one who is in the family and knowing what's coming, that if they knew what I know, they would be running to the Lord and saying, as in the book of Acts, what can I do to be saved? 
I, I want to share a plea for help. Uh, this was given to me a couple of years ago by a person. It's not important about the individual's name, but I, I want to read it so you can get the gist of the content. It's somewhat of a prayer as well as a plea. It says, Dear Lord, I am the only one in this congregation homeless and poor. On top of that, I am a sinner. Please help me because I can't do this by myself. My trust in you is conflicting. Please give me the strength to trust you more. I come to you broken, confused, angry, distracted. I'm afraid to face another day and another week. Amen. To me, that sounds like a person in pain. I don't mean physical pain. No wounds or no hurts on the outside, healing from surgery, but inner pain. Pain of the mind and the heart and the soul. How many of you have read the uh, fourth chapter of John here? and the interaction of the dialogue between Jesus and the woman at the well. How many of you have read this, the entirety of it? Well, you have the fact, and let me just go back for a brief review, that the uh, conversation itself started out when Jesus told his disciples they were in Judea, and he was going back to Galilee. Because he had been in Jerusalem, and he came from Jerusalem to Judea. Now he wants to go back to Galilee. Now he doesn't have to go through this little small village called Samaria. All other Jews always went around that little village to avoid those people that they didn't like. Because there was a lot of racial hatred. But Jesus makes the statement to the disciples at the beginning of this fourth chapter. He says, I must go through Samaria. He didn't say that I think it would be a blessing to go through Samaria or that I have a rendezvous with a woman in Samaria, but I must. It is imperative. Being God, he knew that this lady would be at a well. And he was going to meet her at a certain time. And he was going to encounter her. And that he was going to face her with her mortality and let her know that there was immortality in the eternal life that he was going to give. Now, notice here the conversation. And I'm saying all of this so that you can understand in terms of what the woman says at the end of the dialogue. He asks her for one thing. He says, can you give me some water? He didn't ask her for her name. He didn't ask her for her pedigree. He didn't ask her where she lived. What was she doing there? Did she have any friends? Uh, how large was her family? He just asked her for one thing. Would you give me some water? And then from that one request, a whole conversation came about because the woman replied to him, and, and I'm paraphrasing this, I'm giving this to you as we would see it, as we would think about it, as we would relate it one to another. She, she says to Jesus, uh, you have no business asking me for water because you're a man and I'm a woman and you are a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan. Now, why was that so important? What was the big deal about it? Uh, well, you know that in our day and time, there are drum, uh, drum beaters for women's rights. Amen? And we're living in a day and time where we are seeing, in terms of the status, politically, economically, of women that's becoming stronger, and rising. Things, uh, positions in large corporations, CEO uh, positions and this sort of thing that 
15, 20, 30 years ago, forget about it. We, 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 we are seeing, uh, somebody said miracles. Well, it depends upon the way you define a miracle. But we're seeing things happen today that we would not have even imagined back in the 60s and the 70s. Now, in Jesus' day and time, it was worse then than what it is now. Number one, because the lot of women was considered to be no more than animals or some property that somebody owed, similar to the status of a slave during slavery time. He was not a person, but he was just property. In that day, a woman was not a woman, she was just property. Whatever husband or man told her to do, she had to do it. When they were out in public, she was not privileged to walk next to his side. She had to walk behind him. She was not to speak unless she was spoken to. Amen? Because that was a taboo that was breaking the tradition, <clears throat> excuse me, of that day. And then uh, the next uh, entity is that with her being a Samaritan, and that went way back hundreds of years, way before this incident, that there was racial division between a pure-blooded Jew and a Samaritan. Samaritans were what we have used the term half-breeds, half-Jews and half-something else, whatever something else was, whatever the uh, nationality might have been. Uh, Jews had intermarried among other nations, and this went all the way back to uh, 800 and something, but, or 722, when, uh, when the uh, northern kingdom collapsed and, uh, uh, and the Assyrian Empire, they went in and took over and they just took folk out, brought folk in, stirred them around, and so to speak. Now, you get a brief picture, amen? Now, because of the racial division, because of the hatred, because of the status of women, oh, I forget, let me add another thing to the equation. Jesus was considered to be a Jewish teacher, a rabbi, a sacred man, a holy man, a good man. Not only you, a woman didn't speak in public, but definitely you don't go up to a rabbi and say anything. Uh, even if a rabbi asks you something, you don't respond. So there were many social and economic uh, laws that were broken at this juncture. Well, Jesus knew that. He knew what he was doing. It wasn't a surprise to him because he's God. Now, the woman responds, again, as I said, by saying, you have no business talking to me. And Jesus then replies, if you knew who was talking to you and why I was asking you this request, you would have gladly, hastily, given me some water. And then they go on and she tries to change the conversation and, but finally at the end, uh, she makes a statement that they are looking for the Messiah. And that comes from the Old Testament for one to come. But the Messiah that they were looking for was a military Messiah to defeat the Roman Empire, to destroy it take the Jewish nation out from under their heels, put them back in the sun again so that they will become a great people. They didn't understand that the Messiah was going to be a spiritual Messiah, had nothing to do with politics and military might. And she said, I know the Messiah that uh, they've said that he's going to come. And when he comes... He's going to tell what? He's going to tell us everything that we should know. And then, beautifully, Jesus says, you're talking to him. You are the Messiah? And when he makes that statement, 
It's just like somebody slapping her in the face and she wakes up and this, 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 is, my, this is my turn on it. The woman, Pastor Thornton, said, oh my God, all this time, Brother Wicker, I've been talking to the Messiah. Let me go and tell others in the city. So she runs, and of course, we talked about this, she leaves her water pot, and I'm not going to uh, go into the um, lessons that that, that that lifts up. But anyway, she goes into the city. She tells her friends, and, no, and notice John says that specifically she tells the men. That means something. She just didn't tell the folk. She told the men folk. All right. We got something here that we can chew on, right? Okay. When she tells them that, some of them believe what she said about him, but others said, we got to go to see for ourselves. So they go, and they urge him, just stay with us two days. And he does, because there are souls to be won. And after Jesus gets through talking, whenever God talks, somebody is going to listen. I don't care how hard your heart is, when God speaks, he will gain your attention. So they said, we have seen him, number one. We have heard him, number two. Now we believe, not because of your testimony, but because personally we have had an audience with him. Now, let's look at this woman's faith. First of all, it was a simple faith, a simple faith. She, Jesus didn't ask her to enroll in a class of theology in a class of philosophy. He didn't ask her to debate about anything because she didn't have this kind of knowledge. All she knew is what he told her and she believed. Now, let's look at that because we talk about what? Believing and faith. We use that term loosely and it's just like, uh, just like uh, you remember those what was those things that it was a wooden paddle and it had a ball and you would bolo, bolo bat, was that what it called? Just like a bolo bat, you know, you hit it out, have faith, have faith, believe. And half of the time, we don't even know what we're talking about. What is God's definition of faith? Well, to me, the best definition you can find is in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now, Faith is what? The substance of things, and it is what? The evidence of things I hope for it, which, but what I'm hoping for, it hasn't come to pass, right? It is the evidence. Evidence means something I can prove, but I ain't seen it. Now, when you just break that down, that verse really don't make a lot of, what, intellectual sense. Admit it. How can you have faith and use it as a platform and you ain't even seen what you have faith in? Say amen. Many of us here have been in that same valley that that woman was in before she believed. And even after you believe in Christ, because I was talking, we were talking about this in, in the office, you got to be careful about the enemy because he will come to you and he will put you in a valley, what I call the pity party valley. Not the Super Bowl valley, but the pity party valley. How many of you all have ever been in a pity party? I see three hands. Some of y'all are lying because you've been in that valley. 
I know you have. If you're human, you've been in it. You're just too ashamed to admit it. You won't act like you're a super Christian. Ain't no such thing, no super Christians. You ain't going to become that until you see him face to face. All of us, in one degree or another, have been in that valley. And it doesn't matter about how long you've been in Christ. You can go through some storms in your life that Satan will play with your mind. And if you're not careful, you'll start to thinking in negative ways. And if you keep on thinking that way, it affects your emotions, it affects your spirit, and then you'll find yourself becoming what? Hopeless, helpless, you'll find yourself in despair, you become despondent, all of these things. You don't wish for it to happen, but it's just like a high wave of an ocean just sweeping over you. And it does it so suddenly until when you look up, there you are. And you're wondering. Because the enemy will tell you, now, if God, if he really loves you, and love is supposed to demonstrate itself in a positive way, right? If he says that he loves you, why would he allow this to happen to you? Folk who love one another, protect those folk. Amen? They, as best as they can in our human scheme, we protect our children from bad things from happening. Even though we know we can protect them from everything, but we feel as though that this is a responsibility as a parent that we have. That's the reason why we counsel them. We try to pass on wisdom to them. We try to tell them this is the right step to take. That's the wrong step to take. Why? Because we're trying to protect them. Protect their minds and their hearts and their spirits. Notice that in verse 11, I mean verse 1, forgive me, chapter 11, there are two, two words that pop up. The word sure and the word certain. Now faith is sure for what it hopes for. And faith is certain about that it doesn't see. Is it possible? Can you do it? Are you wasting time? Are you in a land of fantasy like Snow White? Or is this the reality of the world? There are a lot of people, and let, let me try to put these strands together so that we will have a clear understanding. There are a lot of people in this world that have a knowledge of Jesus Christ. They've read about him. They've read books. They've listened to other people talk about him. They have a knowledge of him, but they don't know him personally. You can have a knowledge of Jesus Christ and yet not be saved. Satan has a knowledge of Christ. In fact, his knowledge is more vast and deep than all of our knowledge put together. He knows him inside and out. But he's not going to worship him. He's not going to give him the, the priority, the preeminence in his life. Knowledge is not enough. You got to go further than knowledge. Amen? There must be trust. And you got to say, okay, I don't see it. And everything that I see around me does not give me really a lot of clues, but there are some evidences, like the universe that we live in, when I look at in terms of the cosmos. But when I boil it down to my little world, there's not much evidence. But God said that if you trust me, I'm trustworthy to be trusted. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you good news and you're just sitting there. <laughs> 
Faith is a channel of living trust. It is an assurance. And God is the object of faith. Therefore, God renders faith faithful. Only God can stamp my faith and say that I'm faithful. In fact, let's back up. How do I get faith? God has to give you faith in him. Because of our nature from birth, we are worshipers, but we want to worship everything other than God. Other folk, celebrities, ourselves, you name it. We'll choose a God that, 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 that we like that fits all of our criteria. But beyond that, we're not going to pleasingly and easily worship God. Why is it that scripture over and over and over again has to remind us consistently and constantly that we must praise God? Why? We know we must praise him. Well, what is it in me, not you, because you're perfect, but what is it in me, the imperfect creature, that causes me sometimes to forget not to worship him or not wanting to worship him? It's because of my fallen nature. And I have to be reminded, like sometimes, as a parent, we have to, we shouldn't, but every so often in critical situations, we have to remind our children uh, who they are and who we are. Because sometimes the children want to be who we are. And you have to let them know that I'm the daddy, I'm the mother. You know, uh, like, like, like Jesus said, I, uh, I was here before you got here. And it was through me that you got here. So, in other words, respect me. Remember, in terms of the level of, uh, how can I say it? The level of uh, priorities and, 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 and positions and who is who. God has to remind us in his word who we are at times and who he is. And he tells us all through Isaiah chapter 42, 43, 45, I'm God. I can speak. Nobody can turn around any action that I put into action. I don't care how powerful you are. Put all of the kingdom man in this world together with the United States and Russia and China and Japan. Put them all together with all your might. You cannot reverse if I decide to do something. I'm God. I'm God. And because, now, now, now look at this. I, in fact, I wasn't planning on going in this direction, but the Holy Spirit just brought that to me. Thank you, Lord. Because I am God, there can only be one person that's God. Two people can't be God. Therefore, if I'm God, it means you ain't God. Amen? By deduction, that's what it means. So if you are not God, then who are you? Who am I? I am a creature made by him who says he is God. Therefore, if he made me, I'm obligated, in some areas, what? To thank him. How many of us thank God this morning when we woke up? How many of us thank God for one more day? I do it every morning. The Holy Spirit reminds me now, you got one more day. He allowed you one more day. And I just say, well, Lord, Thank you for one more day that I don't deserve. Because it's not that he's obligated or that I have some kind of hold on him, 
that he's afraid not to give me another day is because he just loves me. And if I'm honest with me, I'm talking about God honesty. I'm not worthy of his love. Now, she had a simple faith. It, it, it wasn't a, uh, um, a learned faith. It was just a simple faith. I believe him. I trust him. With her simple faith, it brought about a simple testimony. She just went and told other folk. Now, John doesn't record what she said, but I'm sure really she didn't have a lot to say. Just come see a man that told me everything about me. And if you think about it, Jesus really didn't tell her everything about herself. That's just what John recorded. But he did tell about how many husbands she had had, and the man that she was with them, with, with, uh, that she was with then wasn't her husband. He told her that. But now he didn't go into the background where she was born, her mom and daddy, if they left her, and blah, 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 you know. But she felt as though that what he did say, it cut down to the core of her soul where she was painting, where she was hurting, where she was empty, where she was sad, where she was afraid, where she was lonely. She needed something, and Jesus, what? Gave her that something. And he didn't give it to her because she deserved to receive it, because she was a woman of the world. He gave it to her because he loved her. Greater love what? The last thing is this. He accepted her as she was. What does that song say? I came to Jesus, what? As I was. How how was I? Weary, wounded, in a bad shape. But I found in what? Him. What did I find? Oh, Lord. And because I found in him a resting place, what did it do? What was, what, what was the result, the outcome? He has made me what? Glad. I'm no longer hopeless now. I'm no longer helpless now. I have something to live for. And I'm not talking about in terms of getting way on down the line another new car or house or whatever the case might be. I'm talking about now I know that when I die, that's not the end of me. I have life beyond the grave. And now I have something that will keep me, which when he gives me him and I receive him, I receive everything that comes from Jesus. What does he give me when I trust in him to receive him? He gives me what? Come on, Dan, don't let me just be holding my fingers up here. Joy, peace, hope, what else? What? Forgiveness, a good one. Love, what else? Righteousness, what else? Come on, we, I, we want an A++ in this class. Come on now, what else? Wisdom. Good. What else? Huh? Who? Oh, knowledge. Well, yeah, knowledge, wisdom. Okay. What else? Who? Come on. Power. Patience. Who? Rest. Somebody say rest. Oh, oh yeah. Rest from stress and strain. Okay, I got you. What else? Stress? Oh, strength, strength. Okay. Okay, anything else? Understanding. P understanding. We could go on and on and on. We don't have enough time to stay here to enumerate when you have Jesus what you receive with Jesus. And when you experience what he gives, 
you are like the ones that came from the village. Nobody has to tell you anything more about Jesus. Why? Because you know about it. Personal experience. You know about it for yourself, right? And how do you, how, 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 ho, 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 how do you know about it about in terms of yourself? It's because of what you went through. And what you went through, there was a voice that told you, now is the opportunity for, for you to what? To put into action what he told you. He told you what? To trust him. Okay, let's see whether he was lying to you or not. So I trust him in the midst of the storm. But the storm doesn't cease. It keeps on raging. In fact, the storm gets worse. And I'm wondering, will this storm destroy me? Will it tear me apart? But then all of a sudden, there is like a calmness in me and the storm is still raging. The fear is removed. Yes! And even though the lightning is flashing, the thunder claps are roaring. There is peace on the inside. And there's a voice that tells me, don't worry. He's got it all in control. Can you see it? Oh, but I know it by faith. I trust him. Now that brings in another aspect and I'm through. That brings in the paths also. Because this ain't the first storm I've been in. Ain't the first storm you're in now. In the past, you've been in some more storms. They may not have been as large and as ferocious as the storm you're in now, but you've come through a storm. Now you got to assess and analyze and think back in your mind. Now, I've come through this storm, and that storm was rough, and I was at a point of hopelessness and helplessness, but what changed my mindset? What changed my heart? And then you start to realize, and it was the object of my faith who was Jesus Christ. And he rendered me faithful to trust him that he was faithful, that he would not deny me. And he says in his word, call on me. I will answer. And I will show you great, oh, great and mighty things you didn't know existed. In other words, I like, I, like, I like to paraphrase that and say, when God gets ready, he can blow my little mind. God can do some things that's not even in my imagination. I can't even pretend that I understand it. But I do know one thing, I saw it. Now, 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 oh yeah. Let's go back to Hebrews 11.1, 1, where it says faith is what? The substance. The word substance means what? Like a foundation, a platform, something that's solid. Not like sand, but it's like Jesus, he's talking about the two houses, one on the rock, one on sand. It's like a rock you are standing on. Faith is the rock that I'm standing on, and it is the evidence. I'm looking at it, but I don't see what I'm hoping for. But the rock tells me, stay there. Because I know if I step down off the rock, I don't know where I'm stepping. It could be quicksand, could be mud, get stuck in it can't move. Quicksand threatens my life. But if I stay on the rock, and I know the rock ain't gonna move, Michael, the rock has been there all the time. So even though I'm still looking like Abraham, and I'm a, I'm a hundred years old, and Sarah's 90, 
ain't got no heir, no son. She's barren, but I'm going to what? Stay on the rock. He said, not they said, or them said, stop listening to they, them, and those, because they are crazier than you are. Stay on the rock. Abraham stayed on the rock. And when he stayed on the rock, what he was looking for, one day it came to pass, and he didn't even know that it was coming to pass. And all of a sudden, God opened Sarah's womb, and the child came forth. And what he was hoping for, looking for, became a reality. Why? Because he... Stayed on the rock. Well, I'm exalting all of us. Stay on the rock. There are going to be times that the enemy will tell you, step down and get off the rock. And he will lie to you. And he will prefabricate an image before you. And he will say, look, I got a, I got a trail out of this dilemma. And all you got to do is just leave the rock and just follow my lead. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> start following his lead. Yeah. Now starting out, yeah. things would look fairly well. But then, following down the line, he will reveal his lies, his deception, his deceit. And you'll start to see where stones have been broken up. Where you're not able to discern which way the trail is going. You'll see some quicksand over here and some mud over there. Then all of a sudden, something will tell you, you should have stayed on the rock. But let me tell you, even though you're between a rock and a hard place. Ow! Go back to the rock. Go back to the beginning from which you started. He ain't going nowhere. The rock ain't moved nowhere. He's still there. Yeah. Oh! You don't mind me just trying to preach a little bit, do you? I have to. You see, a preacher, and I've told you this before, when we go through storms, at least for me, I have to preach mine out. Some shout theirs out, some cry theirs out, but I have to preach mine out. Yeah. Oh! 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 I hope the Lord will let me preach in heaven. I know he ain't, because you'll need to preach it in heaven. But he was just letting me just holler one time. <laughs> Lord! Lord! So sure it's good to see you. Lord! How I get over my soul looks back and wonder. I made it over. Oh! Oh, yeah! Hey. The rock of my salvation. I keep on telling you, I come here not because of you. I love to see you. I love to see you smile. I love to hear your words of encouragement. But my main objective when I come here, I want to see Jesus. You can't turn my midnight into day. You can't blow the dark clouds away. Jesus. <laughs> Sharon, come on to the piano. Because if not, I'll preach on to two o'clock. 
folk be walking out trying to get home for the Super Bowl. <laughs> 